Bill Blake, bring him on, and he'll introduce our panel. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Mayor Steinberg. Thank you, Councilmember Guerra. Um, it's always fun to follow uh, the great orators of our city, so uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm Bill Blake. Uh, some of you know me as that guy who was with B Street Theater for a long time. Um, I'm still Bill Blake, but I do consulting work. <laughs> I do consulting work uh, in the arts and cultural sector, uh, mostly in the Western United States. But uh, every now and then I pop into Canada and do something up there. Um, great to be with you tonight. Um, tonight really is about a conversation, actually. Even though we'll be having a panel conversation up here. Uh, the, the lion's share of the time is really for you to ask questions of the mayor, the panelists, um, or even of each other if you would, if you're so inclined. So um, don't eat or drink too much, but just enough to, uh, <laughs> to kind of steal your courage and come up with some good questions and we'll, we'll get to those in a bit. Um, before I introduce our fabulous panel, we want to see who is in the audience tonight. So we're not going to have you all introduce yourselves. but. By show of hands, how many people in the audience are individual artists, designers, filmmakers? You are an art making, a maker, individual person who makes things. Okay. Excellent. How many in the audience work for an arts or cultural organization? An institution? Fantastic. How many of you know, were, how many of you participated in the Creative Edge cultural planning process? You went to a workshop, a meeting, a presentation, a something. Excellent. How many of you uh, are arts patrons? You like to go to things and write checks occasionally and you're an arts supporter? Oh, hey. I try to give you donors a cover, some cover there. They don't to get besieged. Okay, good. Uh, is anybody out there doesn't like the arts? Raise your hand if you don't like the arts. Okay, good. Oh, well, all right, there were a couple. I think they were actually artists. <laughs> Makes perfect sense to me. Makes perfect sense to me. Okay, great. That's who's in the audience. Do you guys have any other ones? Okay, good. I'm coming up on the stage now. We're going to um, have a conversation with our panelists. I'm going to introduce them by name and title, and then they're gonna tell you their, um, their bios. Uh, with me right here is Neva Floor. She is the Interim Chief Giving Officer from the Sacramento Region Community Foundation. Neva Floor. Mm -hmm. uh, next to Neva is Jack Mitchell, who has a longish title. But Jack is with the state, the arts, media, and entertainment. He's the arts, media, and entertainment consultant with the Department of Education for the state of California, and also the VAPA consultant, which is visual arts, visual and performing arts, you know, yes. stuff. Yeah. yeah, stuff. Jack Mitchell. <laughs> and of course, at the end of the table, Julie Baker is the executive director of Californians for the Arts. Like Americans for the Arts. Terrific. So, Neva, tell us more about you. Sure. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Well, um, first I'd like to say that I am a proud product of public arts education. I learned how to play my first instruments in elementary, middle school. Uh, I participated and competed in uh, concert choir all through high school. I went to undergrad for music and um, graduate school, and I've been able to dedicate the last 20 years of my professional career in the art space. So um, the message that art matters, that it provides opportunity, that it produces well-rounded, empathetic, thoughtful people, that message is not lost on me. Um, and so it has um, certainly catapulted me into a life learning uh, career in the arts. And I brought that wisdom <laughs> that I've been able to cultivate into the foundation world. Um, I'm relatively new to philanthropy. And as an artist who worked in nonprofit for many years, I wanted to get behind the veil <laughs> and understand how philanthropy, how giving, how investment in community space happens. So it was probably no, um, it was pretty serendipitous when uh, the opportunity to serve as grant maker and lead on our creative economy initiative came about. So in 2015, 
Sacramento Region Community Foundation launched four broad strategic initiatives, the creative economy being one of them. And since we've launched, we've been able to invest in the community well over 200,000 in resources and grant making resources. But in addition to that, providing opportunities for capacity building, for peer-to-peer -peer networking and learning and mentorship. Uh, we are probably one of the uh, largest fundraising campaigns in the region with our big day of giving, which is happening Thursday. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we are certainly in the business of expanding philanthropy in the region. And it felt like a rightful place for me uh, to um, to understand gatekeeping as it relates to resources, um, who matters, who decides, and who benefits. And that essentially um, is the role of not just foundations, but, but funding uh, our funding community uh, more broadly. And so um, I, I'm excited to be able to talk about this topic. I think that it is certainly by definition timely. Uh, given the tensions that we are experiencing, and I have to be honest and not to add to the anxiety in the room, um, I'm, it's certainly, I feel like we are at a critical moment, I mean a bit of a crisis in terms of arts funding and for our region, um, and it, it, it evokes for me a very visceral reaction, namely fear, and what will this community look like um, without art? What will it mean for future generations? What will it mean for aspiring artists? What will it mean for the community that is here and for the community that will live and work here in the future? So um, I, I think that uh, all of this work, our work together um, is important and critical. And what makes us really special in the art space is that we're creative. Whatever is not here, we have the ability to create it, the language for it, the nuances for it. We are um, the solution, and I know that you all know that. I feel like um, many of you uh, are, have been in this community longer than I have. Uh, and so I'm always eager to learn from you, and I'm, I'm eager to learn from you tonight. So I'll just I'll leave it there. Thanks, Eva. Take a mic. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for having me here today. It's a real honor to be here among artists. I work at the California Department of Education, and as such, I am not like the people on either side of me, an arts advocate. I'm not here to officially to advocate because I'm not allowed to do that. But I'm here to provide some real serious technical assistance, which we are allowed to do, and to provide some information about arts education and the role of arts education in building communities. Uh, how many of you went to public schools? Okay. How many of you had art in your public schools? Keep your hands up because you are the lucky ones. This is not the case in all schools all the time. And this is a critical issue. Um, when I came to the, I, I taught art, I taught theater in Los Angeles Unified School District for 22 years. Before that I worked for 10 years in the film and television industry. And 12 years ago I came to the Department of Education to be the arts, media, and entertainment industry sector lead. Arts, media, and entertainment is career technical education for the arts. It is art education that prepares students for careers in the arts. All students in school need to have an art class. All students in school need to have dance. But there are a large number of students who want to make their living as artists. And the more prepared they are to enter that arena of arts as a career, the better off they're going to be. So 12 years ago when I started at the California Department of Education, there were 22,000 students around the state in this new industry sector of arts, media, and entertainment. Uh, in the 2017-18 school data, there were 218,000 students in career-focused arts education programs in the state. Arts, media, and entertainment is now the largest industry sector in California education. It is larger than agriculture by 100,000 students. It is larger than health careers by 103,000 students. Okay? And one of the reasons for this growth has been the exposure of, the, of information around the creative economy. 
Uh, if you were in school you pro and you were an art student, you probably had a, conver a long, serious conversation with parents about your backup plan. <laughs> what was your backup plan going to be? Okay? And I know that was the case with me. My, my dad, when I told him that I was interested in being an actor, he s smiled and put his hand on my shoulder and said, what's your backup plan? And, um, but the fact of the matter is that in our society, the arts no longer have to be a backup plan. Uh, the film Black Panther, anybody see Black Panther? Anybody stay for the credits? How many artists worked on that film? Yeah. Yes. Well over 800 artists worked on one film. Yeah. Wow. So there are now careers in the arts, and not only in digital art, in dance, in music. You know, you look at shows like The Voice and, uh, and uh, you know, what's the, the dance one? That we World of Dance. Dan. World of Dance. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you're seeing people in careers in the arts. And so in order for kids to be ready for careers in the arts, they need education. Just like you don't expect kids to be ready for careers in engineering without high quality education in engineering. Well, you really can't expect kids in education to be ready for careers in the arts without high quality education that begins in the sixth, in the <coughs> kindergarten, okay? There are two ed code sections, 50210 and 50220 that state that a well-rounded education includes math, English language arts, social studies, science, visual and performing arts, and career-focused education. So in that same, right there where it says that they have to have English, it says they have to have the arts. But the arts, as you all know, have been marginalized. I came to the department in 2008. In 2008, that was pretty much the, the lowest point. If you were, had an arts education job, you were really one of the lucky ones at that point. But last year, we had 120 unfilled music teacher positions around the state. More positions than we actually had music teachers to fill. And so, as when you are advocating for arts education, which I'm not able to do, it's very important for you. It's very important for you to recognize the role of education. Think back to how you got to where you are and the role that education played there and support arts education. And a lot of that has to do with talking to the people that matter. Uh, and we'll be available. Great. Thank you. Jack Jack Mitchell. what I do for a living, so yay! Um, I'm the Executive Director of Californians for the Arts, which is your statewide arts advocacy organization. How many of you were at the Capitol on Tuesday for Arts Advocacy Day? Yes, there were over 40 um, Sacramentos, I'm sorry, how do you say it, your town, including the mayor who gave us a proclamation yeah. uh, declaring <laughs> by uh, your state senate and the assembly. In fact, the assembly passed it today. So yes. every April, the Arts, Culture, and Creativity Month in California, yay. Yay. you know, a lot of places just do it for a day. We're doing it for a month. Obviously, we want to do it for 12 months, but we can only get them to agree to one month, typically. Um, I don't want to go into long uh, explanation of you know stuff, because I think uh, Bill wants to get into some questions. But um, I'll quickly give my background, which is actually, for 10 years I owned an art gallery, Julie Baker Fine Art, if anyone remember that gallery. And, um, and then for almost another 10 years I ran a venue in Grass Valley called the Center for the Arts and California World Fest, which is a music festival. So um, I am a promoter by trade, that's what I know what to do. I know how to market and um, sell artists and art and the impact it makes um, for our lives, for our communities, and for our economy. And um, now I get to do this on the state level and it's really exciting. We're in very exciting times actually for the state um, because uh, Governor Newsom in his January budget put in $10 million in permanent and increased funding for the California Arts Council, which is your state arts agency. So that's yeah. a good thing. 
Um, we were at historic lows about five, six years ago. We were down to one million dollars. The only reason we had a million dollars was because the NEA matched. We had to have something in there in order to get the NEA match. So in the last uh, about seven, eight years or so, we increased the funding for the state arts agency, the California Arts Council, over 800%. If the funding is passed in the budget for that $10 million, it'll be about $26 million for the Arts Council with another $8 million that they get for the Arts and Corrections programs and a little bit more. So we'll get to about $36 million all told. Um, it's still not where we want to be. We're excited that we have a proactive governor. Um, and it's typically a bipartisan issue. I have these buttons that highlight the art in the middle, so you can check that out. And that's something really... Um, really valuable to actually share in, in terms of a unified message. Um, but uh, I can go into some of the stuff about uh, what we, we're doing at the state level, or do you want to go into some questions first? I think we'll I go into questions, That's and I, I guess okay. when you get to your questions, I bet, I, your, I bet your answers will reference uh, <laughs> stuff you're doing at the state yeah. as illustration, mm -hmm. as illustrative answers, Absolutely. so that'll be awesome. And how you can do it here in Sacramento. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's, there's your, there's your fans. Right. Right. Wow. Right. Okay. So um, now I'm going to ask some questions. Uh, Neva and I are just going to share this mic, so you guys can oh. take those two, and then when the mayor's up here, we'll shuffle around here. Okay. Um, so you've heard us talk about Creative Edge. We've thrown around some terms. Um, Neva, I was going to ask you to kind of talk about Creative Edge, but first, can you talk about what is a cultural plan? Why, oh why, do communities bother doing them? <laughs> Great, well, um, again, by the show of hands in the room, many of you participated in our local creative uh, cultural planning process, but, um, but in jest, a cultural plan is a blueprint. It's, it's, a, it's an, a mechanism to identify what are the key community assets uh, and resources, as well as pointing to potential, uh, how to leverage those assets and resources, identify partners and stakeholders in that, and, you know, make recommendations for the kinds of implementation strategies that will support those, um, those uh, assets. And so it's, it's certainly a process that, depending on who's leading it, can be incredibly inclusive uh, or not. And obviously the, the, um, the downside of it not being an inclusive process is that it doesn't uh, articulate the community uh, wisdom and, and knowledge uh, because we all know that communities have solutions to their own problems. So it's really important uh, when you're engaging in a, a cultural planning process that community is really central to that work, that the strategies are being lifted up from the community first, um, and then you're matching those strategies and mapping onto those uh, resources that can both sustain that work and provide opportunities to leverage that work for the future. So as many of you already know, uh, with 2017, we launched the Creative Edge Cultural Planning Process. The Sacramento Region Community Foundation was a partner and funder uh, of that work. We partnered with the city, of course, and the county, um, and all of you to begin to identify in real time what are the community needs articulated by you all, and what are the resources by neighborhood, right? What are the resources uh, uh, in terms of our nonprofit community? What are some of the challenges that we see? And what are our vision and goal? What's our goal and vision for the future? And we learned a number of things. Uh, the plan articulated four broad, six broad goals, but I think that the ones that probably re will resonate most with you all is number one, that the community that we see represents a diverse community of, of communities that exist here, um, which, which is a cultural equity piece, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we talked about the importance of arts education, right? The value of creating lifelong learning for uh, young people to end, for all of us, right? To participate in the arts, uh, in schools, uh, that we need to expand investment and opportunities for investment for the arts. That's where collaboration and partnership with private and public sector come into play. Certainly our role as, as a philanthropic um, arm of that work is to engage donors in this work as well. And then to, and I'm looking at my notes because uh, I'm a new mom and I forget things, um, to, to build on, the, uh, on Sacramento's unique creative economy. I was actually, we were talking a little bit earlier, um, I was looking at the Otis report, um, the last one, and I was 
just floored to see that of the 70% of the jobs in the creative industry um, that design, me digital media, design, and entertainment made up 70% of the jobs in Sacramento, in the, in the capital region. So that to me was just illuminating. Um, and thinking, you know, in terms of a long investment standpoint, what kind of infrastructure do we need to be developing to not only to support that growing economy, but to provide opportunities for those folks to stay here, right? So yeah, I just wanted to add something, Mayor Steinberg. Was that a number you had heard before? I had not heard that yeah. particular number. Before. So I'm just going to say, in terms of advocacy, that fact really is important. And using that fact in advocacy to your elected officials of why investment in the arts makes sense specifically for Sacramento is what you need to bring to the table. Yes. Yes. Sorry, but I just thought, I noted, I noted that he went, wow. <laughs> yeah, any, any time. Okay. You can approach the bench and I will allow you to come. <laughs> um, Neva, there's um, one thing I wanted to ask you about specifically in the plan. Um, which is about how it addresses something called cultural equity. You convened a cultural equity summit um, recently, but I wonder if you could talk about what that means and how how that came to be in this plan, and and what what our what the vision is for that as far as our culture goes. Sure. Um, well, it's sort of. High level, cultural equity is the ability to uh, create a system that honors and um, brings in the voice of a diverse uh, cast of characters, community, uh, and allows for community members to see themselves as part of uh, both the challenge and sees themselves as part of the solution. So what happens when you, and I'm sure many of you have heard the phrase, we all deserve a seat at the table, right? What has happened historically is that certain communities, particularly fringe communities, underserved communities, have not had historically a seat at that table. And what that table kind of means proverbially is that it is the decision-making table. So what happens when you're not a decision-making table, the things that roll out to your community is often not reflective of your needs. And so part of the process of an, of an inclusive community and an inclusive environment is that it calls in all of the creative wisdom of the communities, that it centers the communities that are impacted most Right, um, and that it provides um, opportunities for all people to be a part of the solution building process. And so cultural equity, because all of you are here, um, you lifted that up as a key priority. And I would say um, just kind of quickly on the, on the sort of funding side of things, Many funders all over the world are leaning into, big foundations, are leaning into this idea of equity. They're understanding that you cannot have the kind of impact that you need to have um, in the long game without including community voice. And in fact, many foundations are now pivoting away <laughs> from organizations that are not demonstrating uh, having that community impact. And so again, another strategy in terms of thinking about the sustainability, the relevancy of our work, <clears throat> that if we're not including all community in this process, we are leaving ourselves out. Um, I'll also say, that um, in terms of our uh, funding community, uh, it was great to see in the cultural plan that we do have a generous region, right, in terms of our, our audiences um, and our art patrons, and we love our patrons, that's great. Um, but uh, we also know that we don't have the kind of heft that we need in terms of institutional partners to begin to sustain this work. Um, and it also means that uh, where individual donors um, don't necessarily have the same accountability measures that government and foundations do, right, people can have the free will to fund who they want, um, we can hold um, a government entities, municipal entities, uh, more accountable to that cultural equity piece. So it's incredibly important uh, if, if, if equity, you know, when we had our uh, convening a few months ago, we partnered with the city, um, we partnered with community stakeholders, I saw Maya in here, and maybe Melissa might be here as well, but, um, and Stacey. Um, but we, uh, what was really important to us was to provide resources, opportunities for nonprofit leaders to talk amongst each other and to learn from one another. We did an informal survey in terms of how many people kind of understood equity as a core part of their work. 
most of the room kind of got it when we asked whether or not there was board commitment at the leadership level to cultural equity. Very different. So there's work that we need to do. Uh, equity is not just the responsibility of one or two people on a staff. It is the responsibility of institutions because we, because we need to invest in our communities. And when we think about what this community will look like in 2040, um, that community needs to be reflected of who will be here. Great, thank you. Um, yeah. um, Jack, on that on that theme, it occurs to me that you know in our in our public schools that in, in theory public schools are distributed throughout all kinds of neighborhoods. And do, is that something that you you think about? Is the state in thinking about education standards for the arts thinking about the equity piece of it? Right. Well, we talked about. Um, this being a good time for the arts and for arts education. One of the things that makes it a good time and that is a sort of a jumping off place for you all when you talk to arts educators is to be aware that the state board just approved new standards for visual performing arts that include media arts for the first time. And so yeah. in California, yeah. there are now five disciplines in the arts, including media arts. Um, and when you're asking about equity, one of the things that was um, we're the first set of standards of in, in, at the department that has included um, um, universal design for for learning as part of the standards process. So that the so that it really the arts are really written for all students, not just those students who technical who previously had access to the arts. All students. Um, there's also a program at the Department of Ed called the Exemplary Arts Programs. And these are schools that are, it's part of the Distinguished Schools Program. And in order to be an Exemplary Arts Program, you have to be at a distinguished school. And one of the things that we have noticed is where are these, where are these distinguished schools that have high academic performance? And what is the role of the arts in these schools? And each year, we identify high quality arts programs, exemplary arts programs in schools. And one of the things we noticed in looking at these applications is that in almost no instances are schools that are high performing schools eliminating arts programs. They maintain arts programs because they realize the value of arts programs for their students. One of the changes in language and, and in, in education language is important. And one of the changes in language that was made by the previous superintendent and embraced by the current superintendent is the transition from STEM to STEAM. Yeah. And yeah. Identifying, yeah. identifying the importance of creativity in that STEM process. And so that's been a huge change for us. Okay. Uh, Looks like you're going to say something, I was going to say that there's actually um, a bill right now that uh, Senator Hertzberg brought forward, which is a STEM Poet Laureate. And I spoke at the hearing and said, there's something missing, the A. And so I would encourage you, as you're all arts advocates in this room, to write to Senator Hertzberg and say, we want it to be STEAM, not STEM. Because these are the sorts of things that more and more, if we continue to use those terms, then it becomes something that people believe in. But if we continue to go back to STEM, we're going to have those continued challenges. Right. And when you look at STEAM education, the people who are advocates for STEAM education are not the artists. Boeing is a huge supporter of arts education because Boeing knows that the critical component for their engineers is creativity. It's not the math. The, you know. Yeah. So, so let me ask you, you, two, you two this. So this is all true. This room believes in, I think a lot of smart people in our country believe this stuff. Why is it so hard to get money for the arts in schools? Why is it hard to get money for the arts in schools? Man, we could just be mad about it for a minute and move on to another subject if you want to, but what, what is the deal? Is it hard to get money for the arts in schools or is it hard to actually get it to be accountable? 
one of the issues that we have in our state, right, is that there's actually, there is funding in your schools. Part of the issue is that you're not showing up at those school board meetings and saying that arts are being eliminated from my kid's school when it's actually supposed to be there. The statistic is, and I thought it was one in four schools are actually delivering the arts ed code, but um, you, Jack was saying that it's even worse than that. So that's where it comes to an issue of like, again, I mean, since my job is to tell you to be, arts, to be advocates, it is that you actually have to make that case um, for it. You always have to make the case. And data is really, really important for elected officials. Um, what Mayor Steinberg said first when he got here was be powerful and be organized because there are a lot of other people who are. And, and they're fighting for that same amount of money. And when you think about it, think about it as a bucket, right? So there's all these buckets in elected officials' offices. They've got the environment, they've got housing, they've got homelessness, they've got all these issues that they're trying to address. And the arts are something that you care deeply about, but maybe that hasn't been at the top. And now we're lucky you have a mayor who believes in that because he's also had this phenomenal person, Dennis Mangers, talking in his ear for all these years. And we're lucky, you're lucky to have that. But those buckets, they watch those buckets and how full they get with letters and facts, literally faxes. We faxed um, the state one year and they were like, stop faxing the letters. We, you know, you're driving us crazy. But what it meant, it meant that people, there were people who actually cared about this issue. So you want to fill the arts bucket in your elected official's office so that when they go to their meetings and they say, there is a large group of people who care deeply about this issue and they are going to elect or not elect you if you, address, if you don't address this issue, right? So that's what you need to be doing as arts advocates and that's what he was saying in terms of look at me as an ally, show up with the facts. It's really easy for us and I'm a hugely passionate arts person to be showing the passion. And that's really important. Storytelling is a really key component of being an effective advocate. However, that story has to include facts and data, just like these folks. And you have that in your Creative Edge plan. Go to it, use it, use those numbers. I'm gonna give you an example of what we've done at the state level. So um, the, Econ uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which is out of DC, came out that the California's creative economy at the state level is 7.1% of the gross state product. It's ahead of agriculture, which is California, and transportation, right? So I say this over and over and over again. I show up at committee hearings, I make a public comment, I say it, we put it on our arts advocacy poster, that one statement we said it over and over again as a fact, right? And then we, we created a messaging campaign Arts create impact. We did a 30-day social media campaign. We invited communi the community, anyone who wanted to submit a story to say how arts creates impact for them, whether it was about housing, whether it was about public safety, what homelessness, mental health, wellness, all these different things. We then invited elected officials to come and share their arts impact story. On our, our advocacy day, we had 12 elected officials take the time out of a very busy legislative day to share those stories. And the point is that when you start to crystallize your message with whatever marketing media message you want it to be, if, it, if you want it to be hashtag creative force for <laughs> Sacramento, then call it that. But everybody has to have the same message. You guys all have to speak from the same platform and represent yourselves in that way. And then what happens, and this happened to me the other day, I was in a committee hearing, and I see your hand just the way it's like, Senator Stern said, um, he was there for the Youth Poet Laureate Bill, which is really cool, we're, gonna get, we're hoping to get one of those, and Senator Stern said, well, you know, the creative economy is 7.1% of the California state, and he's repeating my words exactly, right? Or Californians for the Arts words exactly. That's what you want to give your elected officials. You need to give them the data, give them the storytelling, create that really crystallized message that you're all speaking from, and then show up. You have to show up. You have to show up at those meetings tomorrow. You have to represent a force. Woo! So, um, let me just check in on time, or how are we doing? Hold on, I see you. Take the question. Okay, go ahead. Hi, 
Um, no, we have plenty of time. I just want to make sure sequ sequence wise. We're, we're, yeah. My name is Kyle Osborne. I'm a soccer coach. Microphone. Um, I heard a lot, of, a lot of talk today here about funding the arts in public education. And while I definitely see the value in that, I myself am a self taught poet. I've been writing since, since I was seven. And I didn't really get a lot of institutional help from that via school. What I also can tell you is that, especially in the marginalized communities that you guys are talking about, students have very real and tangible trauma to do with school and learning in general. And therefore, putting funding only in like public education in regards to how you focus on the youth and allowing them to like facilitate or like grow their like artistic sense of creativity and all that, if we only focus on the public education system, if we only focus on the schools, I am telling you that there are young people like myself and others who are even more marginalized who will be left out of the equation. There are kids who don't go to school because their teachers look at them like they're monkeys. There are kids who don't go to school because every time they laugh, it's too loud and they sound too aggressive and so they're getting kicked out of class or whatever. So even if they're going to art class rather than have like the best teachers and all the most like wonderful, like, you know, new art supplies and all that, they're still dealing with that trauma. They're still dealing with that school to prison pipeline. They're still dealing you know, dealing with parents they see maybe an hour a day because they work three jobs, all of that. What I'm saying is that while we talk about investing in avenues within public education for kids to explore their creativity, we also, I implore you, need to be investing in programs outside of schools where kids can go and feel like they are not isolated and feel like they are not shut yeah. down by the racist and public education system. All right. <laughs> What did you say? You were the youth poet laureate for Sacramento? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I can see the way you were orating and the way you speak. That was fantastic. I would say two things. One is that there are statistics that say reasons many kids show up at school is because there's arts available. So that's one thing. We don't want to not have it in the public schools. That's and then, awesome. I know, I know, I know, I know. And then secondly, I just want to say that there's a lot of programs. That's part of what we're fighting for on the state level is to make sure that there's enough funding at the state level to make arts accessible for every Californian so that there's money within arts councils and smaller organizations that are working within communities to be able to provide programs like that. So yes, I 100% agree that we need all of that. Uh, Nia's going to respond, and then we're going to take one question, and then we're going to have the mayor up here, and we'll have lots of questions. We've got a lot of time, so. Yeah, I think you. I think you raise. I mean, a very valuable point, and um, certainly the arts ecosystem. And I think it's really important um, that we think about an art ecosystem that complements and doesn't compete, right? Because it. it we, there are certainly many different parts. It's, our arts ecosystem is sort of made up of a patchwork design of various kinds of strategies, funding streams, stakeholders, and what you're speaking to is absolutely correct. In, it, in, it, in as much as it's important for us to invest in arts education, it's also important for us to invest in our nonprofit sector that often provides those critical resources and programming um, that speak specifically to the needs of the community that they serve. And so I think when we talk about an arts ecosystem, when we talk about a creative economy, I hope that we're not positioning one in, uh, we're not creating an arbitrary hierarchy in terms of what's, what is more important. It actually requires all of those different pieces to be working in concert, the pun is it absolutely, um, um, to be working in concert um, to be able to get to that broad goal. And someone said this, and I'll end on this, that was very kind of um, illuminating for me. She is um, definitely works in the art space. She has been for many years and she said, we, as an art sector, need to be fighting for the same cause and not the same bucket of money, yeah. right? We need to be fighting for the same cause and not the same funding. And I think illuminating, that was a very illuminating comment for me because it's true, we, we need to find the cause, and we do, we get it, we know it, we talk about it all the time, but the resources will come. We can find the resources. So I just I, so I just wanted to, to illuminate on that that it is a it is a it is a multi tiered strategy that involves all of those moving parts. But the arts are part of the solution.